think we can begin. Uh, thank you for coming to Peter's event. This was bringing massive flexibility to a slice of market. My name is Alex Peters. I'm the last person to be doing the LLS systems. And I will be sharing and facilitating um, Peter's events. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce the examiners. Uh, we have Associate Professor Johanna Marci from the University of Malta. Uh, we have Professor Luigi Marcadello from the University of Melbourne. And uh, from this view, and uh, with the Life Systems, Peter Setter Dyson. So, Peter did uh, an industrial PhD, so he had um, supervision, and he conducted his PhD in both CPU and IBM, and um, supervisory team consisted of. Uh, the main supervisor, Jamal Katipur, Professor uh, Jamal Katipur from CPU with the Lens Systems, and also senior researcher uh, Penny Peter from the same uh, department. And from IBM, we have um, associate partner Peter Skolski from IBM uh, Client Innovation Center, and uh, Managing Director Stephen Smith from uh, the same department. Um, now, a bit about the process. Peter will now give a talk about um, his findings and we'll talk about his PhD work. This will take around 45 minutes. And after it is done, then um, we will have a time to give a short break for people to sit down. And then we will proceed with the QA session. For that, uh, whoever wants to stay is welcome to stay. Also, from the photo during our lives. Uh, but those who don't want to stay for the whole QA, uh, we would like to uh, ask them to leave the And finally, the whole process should take maximum three hours. So by 4 p.m., uh, we should be done. Um, I will explain more how we do the QA. We start with the examination committee and then the supervisor. But if there is time, we can take some questions from the audience. But we'll see later. Um, so now, uh, Thank you, Harris. So welcome to my PhD defense called Bringing the Management Flexibility to Antilles Service Markets. Jalal already introduced all my supervisors. Well, sorry, Harris already introduced everyone. So is the microphone working and people online can hear everything? Good? Yes. All right. So why studying demand side flexibility? Well, more and more renewables are coming into the grid, uh, but they're intermittent. They pose a challenge to uh, balance the power grid, and keeping the frequency stable at around 50 hertz. Traditionally, we, uh, we, we can stabilize the power grid using flex flexible generation that's backed by fossil fuels. So it would be a little bit more sustainable and interesting if we can use existing infrastructure like flexible demand to do the same thing and stabilize the power grid. But what is flexible demand? What is demand side flexibility? Well. A simple example is basically that we have some kind of uh, power consumption asset and we're able to turn the power off for a certain amount of time and then we turn it back on again. This ability to shift power consumption in time, that's worth something to the power grid and we can monetize that from the flexible demand perspective as well. So I've been doing industrial PhD with uh, IBM and uh, they've been developing a flex platform and what it does is that it harness uh, flexibility from uh, many different demand side assets into the platform figure out, figures out how much flexibility there is and bid it into an silly service market and activate the assets when called upon. So the perspective taken in my PhD and my journey is very much the one taken from IBM's Flex platform, kind of coming in as, a, as an aggregator from the outside and figuring out how do we actually bring demand side flexibility to an silly service markets, uh, specifically in Denmark. So that really motivates the, uh, the, uh, the PhD project and the use cases in, in some of the research questions that I've done are from uh, IBM's Flex platform. So basically, three research questions were, 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 were made. The first one, what is the Danish ecosystem for bringing the mad side flexibility into ancillary service markets? Uh, and the second one is, okay, given that we know that, how do we then monetize flexibility from individual assets? And how do we go from individual assets to a portfolio of assets and monetize that and assess the synergy effect of aggregating many assets. So there are a couple of contributions uh, in, in, in during this uh, PhD project. Uh, they are twofold. So the system-oriented contributions consist of uh, uh, basically assessing how incentivized aggregators and demand-side flexibility is to participate. 
Uh, and we conclude that uh, the new market model, Denmark, will incentivize demand side flexibility even more. We also see that load shifting can be, uh, can be quite profitable at times, which can pose a problem for the TSO, uh, we argue. We also developed a bi-level optimization problem for the TSO to investigate how we can procure more flexibility from demand side uh, aggregators versus also the security of supply of doing so. And then we also have some individual oriented contributions on a more technical level. So again, how we monetize flexibility from assets, in particular thermostatically controlled loads or TCLs. We also developed a novel two-stage uh, bidding uh, optimization problem, a uh, two-stage stochastic mixed integer linear program, uh, uh, program for bidding into the MFR market in Denmark. We quantify the synergy effect of aggregating assets uh, into a portfolio, and we show how we can use Shapley values to allocate payments from an aggregator's perspective to its flex uh, flexible demands within its portfolio. Finally, we also formulate a mathemat mathematical optimization problem using joint change constraints on how to specifically bid stochastic resources like demand-side assets into Danish ancillary service markets while adhering to, to a requirement from the TSO in Denmark. I'll come back to all of these later on the presentation. So six papers were made during the PhD thesis. The first one uh, uh, regarding the first research question on the ecosystem of demand-side flexibility in Denmark. Paper B and C. Uh, regarding research question number two, uh, how to monetize flexibility from two TCLs uh, using uh, two assets from IBM's Flex platform. Paper D is about the synergy effect and Shapley values, allocating payments. Paper E and F is about this new requirement of how to bid stochastic resources into ancillary service markets. And also paper E is about the synergy effect. So paper E was made by a uh, uh, co-supervised two master students and uh, we just received uh, reviews and we'll submit or resubmit again in the forthcoming months. So the outline of this uh, presentation follows the research questions uh, and very much also the journey I've taken chronologically from the beginning, not knowing anything about demand side flexibility to actually figuring out how do we bring it into ancillary service markets and then monetizing it. So first looking at uh, the ecosystem in Denmark, and what I want to emphasize here is that coming in as an aggregator on the demand side, like IBM's Flex platform, we need to harness flexibility from flexible consumers. In order to do that, we need also to form a business relationship with the demands BRP. And a BRP in Denmark is a balanced responsible party, an entity that's responsible for production, consumption, and trading. And we cannot, do, uh, uh, we cannot harness the flexibility without, without also having that uh, business relationship. So, and we need to have that for every single unique BRP for every single demand that we, that we contact. And that poses a high barrier to entry for, a, for an, an, let's say, aggregator coming from the outside. But in the new market model in Denmark, uh, so allegedly uh, implemented already next year, um, we split out the demand side aggregator from this structure. So allowing the aggregator to harness the flexibility from many different uh, consumers directly without having to form a business relationship with, with uh, BRPs. And I want to emphasize that this is primarily for energy intensive ancillary services where energy is actually involved in the response uh, when a demand side aggregator activates assets. And as you can imagine, in that case, the, the aggregator can, can cause imbalances to many different uh, 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 consumers and therefore their BRPs as well. So this, uh, all, all by this lowers uh, the, the, the barrier to entry for aggregators, it also increases the complexity in terms of settlement. So the new market model incentivizes more demand side flexibility in aggregators, but again, this settlement needs to be accounted for, for it from, from a system perspective. So talking now I've talked a little bit about the ecosystem in Denmark. I want to move on to how we monetize flexibility from individual assets, in particular, two assets from IBM's Flex platform, a stylized supermarket freezer that's able to be flexible today, and a sink galvanizing furnace that can become flexible. And the methodology for doing so is that first, we want to estimate the temperature dynamics of these two assets, their TCLs. So any impact, when you play around with the power consumption of these assets, it will impact the temperature directly. And then, Given that we know that, okay, how do we then use the flexibility in these assets in a given revenue stream? And that's primarily ancillary services, but we also talk about load shifting. And then finally, how do we embed all that in a profit maximization problem? So starting with the supermarket freezer, uh, we see here a simplified schematic where we have uh, frozen food that basically 
contains the flexibility in terms of thermal inertia. And we have a power uh, that basically provides coolant to, to the freezer that cools the air temperature in the freezer, which we measure. And then we have an unobserved uh, food temperature as well. So by, by, by creating a second order model or gray box model that captures just the most fundamental physics, we can develop, uh, we can assess how the temperature in the food and the, the air will develop when we change the power input. So for the food, there's a heat exchange with the air temperature in the freezer and the other way around for the air temperature. And then there's also a heat loss to uh, the ambient temperature in the supermarket. And of course the coolant uh, decreases the temperature in the freezer. So when we have that kind of state space model here, we can verify that it's right, that it follows the measurements and so on, as you see here to the left. And then to the right, between hours 10 and 12, we can see how turning the power down increases the air temperature in the freezer and the food temperature follows all by the slower pace. And then there's an inevitable rebound afterwards because it has to rebound. And the ability for the freezer to do this is worth something to the power grid. And we can monetize that in ancillary service markets. The question is, how do we do that? Well, in Denmark, we have two bidding zones or two zones. The Western part of Denmark consists of, uh, it's connected to continental Europe. There we have primary reserves, FCR, secondary reserves, AFR, and tertiary reserves, MFR. And the eastern part of Denmark is uh, connected to the Nordic power grid with less inertia. And there we have many more services because uh, it requires more, uh, it's, it's, it's less stable. In the future, uh, Energinet estimates, so the Danish TSO Energinet estimates that they will procure much more tertiary reserves or MFR already in 2030 and also in the years after that. So that's really interesting. That really motivates uh, why we can use demand side flexibility for this kind of market. And we really do look a lot at MFR, and I do look a lot at it in this thesis as well. So MFR is a uniform pricing auction. We get a payment for both reservation and activation, and it's a slow acting reserve. We also look at FCR, so frequency containment reserves in the western part of Denmark, and the kind of the corresponding one in eastern part of Denmark as well. And those two doesn't have energy involved. It's just about power and being fast. Uh, and, and we look at those three uh, in, uh, in this thesis, and we also look at the uh, load shifting. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So in particular for MFRR, it's interesting how we've been into that market and how we model that mathematically. So there are two stages. So in the first stage, we bid a, a reservation power bid for each hour in the subsequent day. And then on the same day, we also uh, make a regulating power bid for each hour in the subsequent day for those hours that we actually want a reserve power bit. And then in the real time stage, we, uh, we might get activated, we might not get activated. What's for sure is that we get paid for our reservation. And then if we get activated, we get paid for the energy that, that we actually activate with. And then there's a rebound cost because we consider two TCLs. And then we also introduce a penalty cost due to basically imposing that there should be a penalty for not delivering the promised capacity. So the optimization problem for such an MFR bidding model ultimately results in a two-stage stochastic mixed integer in your program. So we maximize the objective function I just showed, but we also introduce scenarios uh, omega uh, for, uh, for, for the second stage. And then we constrain the model with uh, the temperature uh, model that I showed before, the stage-based model. And then also with this function H, and H is related to primarily two things. The first one is the sequence of getting activated. I'll show that in the next slide, but also the uh, real-time stage when we have to activate and, and when do we rebound and so on and so forth. And there are a bunch of auxiliary variables related to that. The important thing here is that we maximize our reservation capacity and we make a regulating power bit, and then we might activate something in real time as well. So it's quite interesting to, to model this logic of when we get activated in the MFR market. So if we have a non-zero reservation bit in a given hour, then we get activated only if our regulating power bit is within the merit order of the regulating power market. But also there should be some kind of upregulation in, in the system. So, and we, we don't really control that, that's a, a, on a system perspective. So that's also a condition that needs to hold. And we can, we can encode that logic in this constraint down here where we say our balancing uh, power that we activate with uh, in a given hour, in a given scenario, omega should be larger than the res reservation power that we won in the previous day. 
if this condition holds, and then there's a slack variable to, to account for the uh, capacity not delivered. And this con if this condition holds, that's a bilinear constraint because we multiply it with the reserve power and we can linear linearize it using a McCormick relaxation. So by introducing auxiliary variable G, that is a binary variable equal to one, if we need to act activate, then, uh, then, we can, uh, then we can basically split it out and it becomes linearized. We also introduce variable uh, phi and uh, that basically corresponds to the power we need to activate with. And then the cost of doing this is that we also introduce a big M variable and we need to set that somehow. In this case, it's fairly easy because we can just set it to the nominal power of the asset. It's basically bound, bounding how much flexibility it can deliver. So in total, we then get this two stage stochastic mixed into linear program for bidding into the MFR market. Luckily, it's a little bit easier for load shifting. Here to the left, I just show the simplest version of uh, load shifting. So what is load shifting? That's basically consuming more in uh, low price hours and consuming less in high price hours. And here I talk about the spot price or the hit price. So why is this interesting for, from a flexible demand? Well, it's very easy to get started with. We actually don't need an aggregator to do that. From, it's purely for individual gain that a flexible demand can do that. But we argue that that's not necessarily good for the system or for the TSO because it, the flexibility is not explicitly uh, used for financial services and might not correlate with what the system needs at that point in time. So for frequency, frequency containment reserves or FCR, we also have a simple linear program. We maximize again the reserve capacity that we've been in for our asset and we constrain it according to our temperature model. And then we just follow uh, Q is basically just following the uh, frequency with the power set. So for the stylized supermarket freezer, uh, I here show the, uh, the operational costs. And in the, the thick black line shows the, the operational cost today. And then the blue and red ones are for two MFR models. And what we see is that uh, they re both reduce the operational costs. And so uh, the same is the case for load shifting in yellow. What is interesting here is that load shifting in a large part of 2022 is really profitable and really decreases costs a lot. And that was due to very volatile spot prices in that period. But load shifting is, um, is really, it can be detrimental, detrimental to the temperature in the freezer. Every time we load shift, it impacts the temperature. But not necessarily for MFR, because as you might recall, MFR, we get paid also for reservation. So we just earn a reservation payment without necessarily having to activate. Of course, when we do activate, it also impacts the temperature. So it's a little bit of a trade-off to see which one is best. Also for MFR, we have to share the revenue with uh, an aggregator, perhaps also a BRP. And load shifting is so easy to get started with. So for the second uh, asset that we've looked at, it's a zinc galvanizing furnace. So, so what is that? That's basically a, a, a big furnace with molten zinc at around 450 degrees. It's galvanizing steel elements for anti-corrosive. And there are two power inputs in the furnace, in the upper zone and lower zone. And then we measure the temperature on the wall of the furnace, both in the upper and the lower zone. And then what we're really interested in is actually the zinc temperature that we don't measure but it's uh, within uh, both zones as well. Then there can be a lid on the furnace as well when, we're not, well when it's not in use. So here, instead of having a second order model, we have a fourth order model because there are four temperatures that we are interested in. And again, it's the same pr principle as before. There's heat transfer between the temperatures in all the zones. And then uh, there's a, a power input as well to both zones that will increase the temperature of the sink. And then there's also whether the lid is on or off also uh, 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 impacts the temperature. So there's more loss or heat loss when, it, when the lid is uh, off. So having this kind of uh, uh, state-based state model embedded in the optimization problem, we can, we can basically do the same thing as we did with the stylized supermarket freezer. So for this single galvanizing furnace, looking at FCR and MFR, we see that when participating in FCR, we reduce costs a lot. So, okay, that seems very attractive, but also I have to recall that FCR prices were really high until around the end of 2022 when, when that market became part of continental Europe. So it's not guaranteed to, to continue in the future, but still it seems really good. And also for FCR, the impact on the temperature were almost uh, not significant. It was not significant at all. Whereas when actually uh, uh, participating MFR with the uh, furnace, 
we saw sometimes that it would impact the temperature a lot, and sometimes as much so much that the the the, the sink could uh, solidify and actually crack the furnace. Uh, so MFR is really not um, suited as it is now, perhaps, but perhaps in the future with with uh, fifteen minute resolution in the markets, it, it can be more interesting. So in summary. We see that TCLs can profit and reduce the operational costs by participating in ancillary service or by doing load shifting. And we see sometimes that load shifting can be extremely profitable, might pose a problem to the TCO. FCI is very attractive, especially for these industry, uh, big, big furnaces and whatnot in the industry that are simple, single state processes. If they can have power equipment that that allows them to participate in, in, in FCR in these fast uh, insular service markets. That's very attractive. It has almost no impact on the temperature. All right. So we are now going from a uh, how we monetize flexibility from individual assets to how we monetize flexibility from a portfolio of assets. And what is interesting here is, first of all, how do we assess the synergy effect of aggregating a lot of assets, assets together? And we show some case studies on that, both uh, simulated and using real data from, from EVs when bidding into the FCRT market. Then we also take a little bit of detail and show how an aggregator can pay its flexible demands using Shapley values. And then the last part of this research question is uh, concerned with uh, the new P90 requirement of energy net in Denmark. I'll talk much more about that later. So if we look at the synergy effect, we need to first define it. You might recall the profit for MFR here. I also introduced the energy cost. Then we say that the uh, reservation power that bid into the MFR market is the sum of the individual reservation powers for each asset in the portfolio. You see here to the right that we have many, many assets. Individually, they are quite unpredictable, but as a portfolio, portfolio consumption is quite predictable. And we simply define the synergy effect as the portfolio profit divided by the sum of profit for, for each asset acting on its own. And here we say that there's synergy in the activation part only, not in the uh, reservation part. And in a simulated case study, we see that the synergy effect can be really big for, uh, for MFR, almost doubling the, the profit, as you see here, 1.9. But as soon as we introduce the rebound, as was the case for the TCLs I showed before, then the synergy effect is much less. And that's because when we have more assets, we, we, we get activated more, but we also incur a rebound cost as well. And that rebound cost takes away some of the potential. That's a shame, but that's how it is with uh, TCLs. In a case study with uh, EVs bidding into FCRD, we see here to the left that uh, we start out with uh, uh, 70 groups of EVs with 20 in each, and then we bundle them uh, less and less to, uh, more and more together. And then finally, we have one group with 1,400 EVs. And when bidding that into FCRD, we, we, we earn much more money than, than when they're acting on their own. So there's a synergy effect there as well. It's quite interesting. And they have no rebound. And we show that the profit for an EV during a year can be 850 uh, kroners at least for the year of 2023. Again, excluding a, a revenue sharing with an aggregator. And what is interesting here as well, uh, just to note, is that the upper bound potential, we are quite far away from that. And perhaps uh, uh, we, we can do better by having a better prediction model of the available flexibility in our portfolio. But I'll leave that for future work. So the aggregator faces a problem of paying its flexible demands after an activation has happened. So let's say we have five flexible demands in our portfolio, and how do we pay, uh, pay some money back to, to those? How should they be distributed? And instead of relying on baseline forecasts, predicting the counterfactual consumption of each demand, we can use Shapley values. And what we do here is that we assess how we would have performed, how much we would have earned, uh, in case this particular demand was not part of the grand coalition and all possible sub-coalitions within uh, uh, within uh, the five demands. And by doing that, we, 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 we can discover some interesting things. So in this case study, we have that uh, D1 thinks that it's flexible, but it's not in reality. I mean, that, that could really happen. We, we, we could say to the freezer, turn the power consumption off, and it doesn't do it for some reason or another. And in this case, we see that uh, for, for, for the flexible demands, they, they, uh, 
their profits are bigger when the inflexible demand is part of the portfolio, even though it's inflexible, because the, the orange line is uh, bigger than the blue, uh, green line. And for the inflexible demand, it actually earns money up until a certain point when it's penalized too much for not delivering its uh, capacity. But in any case, it's always uh, better for, for the uh, inflexible demand to be part of the portfolio rather than acting on its own. Again, that's a testament to the, uh, the impact of the synergy effect. It's quite significant. All right, so Energinet in Denmark has, has come up with a new idea. It's basically, how do we allow stochastic resources? It could also be wind and solar, but we are concerned with flexible demand. Uh, how do we allow these to bid into ancillary service markets without expecting 100% reliability when, when they do that because they have stochastic consumption? So can the TSO relax this requirement somehow? Uh, and the answer is, uh, is yes. The Danish TSO in Denmark has, has done that. It's called the P90 requirement, and it's twofold. The first part says that there's a 90% chance that the sole capacity, the bid we make, should be uh, available. And that's quite interesting because now we can actually bid something in and then 10% of the time we don't have to deliver the capacity we offer. But in those 10% of the time, it also says that only some part of the total capacity uh, is not available. And what does that mean? Well, that's a bit of a soft constraint. We don't really know, okay, so what's the magnitude here? But the first part is very much something we can model mathematically. Specifically, if we look at the 90% chance here, it's very interesting because this almost, it, they almost say use chance constraints to do that. So we can, we can basically uh, formulate an optimization problem using joint chance constraints to model this specific requirement that the Danish TSO has made to cater for stochastic resources and demand side flexibility to be bid into its ancillary service markets. If you look to the left here, we have some, some demand and it has some consumption, and we see it's 90% quantile as well. In this simple case, the capacity it could offer, according to this rule, is, uh, is, is then the 90% quantile in either direction or in both directions. And we can, math we can build a mathematical model uh, that states exactly that. We say we maximize, again, our capacity that we've been into the market, so from an aggregator's perspective. And then we say that, okay, the probability that our capacity that we bid in is less than the exposed realized power consumption of our portfolio uh, should be greater than 0 0.9 when epsilon is 0 0.1 for every minute in every hour henceforth. And, that, and, and, and that's, that's interesting, right? Because then we simply, now we have an, uh, a mathematical optimization model that allows us to exploit this requirement. So from an aggregator's perspective, we can maximize profit while adhering to the regulations, and we allow our asset to, to uh, in our portfolio to not deliver the promised capacity sometimes. So how do we, pro uh, how do we construct the tractable formulations of, of this, uh, this uh, joint change constraint? The first one we propose is conditional value at risk. It's a linear program, um, and I won't talk too much about it, but what we do here is that we maximize the expected value of the epsilon worst or the 10% worst samples, so what that means is we consider also the magnitude of violations uh, implicitly in, in, in this formulation. A second approach is to use something called also X. This is a uh, mixed integer linear program, but we relax it and solve it iteratively as linear programs, and then we get the optimal solution. What is interesting here is that we do not consider the magnitude of violations. We only consider the violation frequency. So also X is more aggressive, or let's say CVAR is more conservative than also X. And I'll come back to some interesting results on that later. Okay, let's take it a step further. Right now we have some kind of distribution of our flexibility in our portfolio, in our domain side portfolio. It could be our EV portfolio. So imagine that we, uh, that we uh, estimate the flexibility in that EV portfolio in the summer, and we uh, use that when bidding in the winter, then we can easily imagine that there's non-stationarity in that, that distribution of the available flexibility because EVs consume much more in the winter than they do in the summer. So when we have that of kind of non-stationarity or misspecification in our distribution of, uh, of the available flexibility in our demand side portfolio, how do we take optimal decisions given that? 
And that actually, it doesn't matter if we use just historical samples or if we, if we use a probabilistic forecast or prediction model or whatnot. It's basically about taking optimal decisions given that. So here we can impose distributional robustness on our joint chance constraint. So instead of saying that the probability should be greater than 90% that we can deliver our capacity, we say the probability should be greater than 90% in the worst case distribution of the available flexibility we have. And the worst case distribution is then defined within an ambiguity set uh, of some Wasserstein distance theta away from, from our original distribution of the available flexibility. So here we allow ourselves to look at distributions a little bit further away from, or potentially a lot further away from our data or our predictive distribution. All right, so we also need to provide a tractable formulation for that. Uh, and we do so here. It's a mixed integer linear program. What is interesting is that we need to pre-specify the Wasserstein distance theta, or just let's call it the conservative, uh, conservativeness level. So when theta is close to zero, we, we just look at the almost the, the, the empirical distribution that we have. But when we allow theta to be large, or we set theta to be large, then we look at distributions of our available flexibility far away from our empirical distribution. So a large theta con con corresponds to a more conservative bit. So going back to, to our original joint change constraint and looking at also X and CVA for our portfolio of EVs, uh, in the case that I showed before, and evaluating that out of sample, we see that also X exactly, almost exactly hits the violation frequency of 10%. It's designed to do that, but worth noting with also X is also, it's not just the quantile that it's bidding, it's able to exploit the, uh, the hours or minutes that are better to violate the frequency in than, than other minutes or hours. And then with CVAR, we see that it's much more conservative as expected because we consider the magnitude of violations. So it has a violation frequency of only 4%. So what that means is that also X is more profitable. It's the 850 DKK per year per EV that I showed before, while CVAR is less profitable. So again, going back to the distributional uh, robust version of the joint chain constraint, we see here to the left in sample that we estimate our flexibility somehow. And the green line is also X. It's almost hitting the 90% quantile. And then the, the, the blue line, uh, sorry, the, uh, the yellow line is CVAR. It's more conservative, it's lower. And then the most conservative one is the uh, distributionally robust version of our bin. And in sample, we see that, okay, yeah, that one, the, the distributionally robust one also earns less. We, we can see that. But when we go out of sample, again, the motivating sample here could be uh, uh, EVs, uh, EV data estimated in the summer, and then the available flexibility that we get from that, and then actually go to the winter and bid that in. And we see, that, uh, we artificially introduce non-stationarity here, and we see that only the distributionally robust version is able to kind of keep below the quantile and actually adhere to the P90 requirement of the Danish TSO. The other two, including CVAR, are too aggressive. So a distributionally robust way of bidding our, our flexibility can in some cases be really good when we believe that there's non-stationarity in, in the flexibility of a portfolio or that we know that we somehow has misspecified it. But we can also use distributionally robustness for, from another perspective. We can take the TSO perspective or the system perspective and say, okay, we have introduced this new rule and we just, let's say, arbitrarily set the, uh, the level to 90%. Given that we know that each aggregator maximizes profits, exactly as I just showed, how can the TSO maximize its procured flexibility minus what's not available because people or aggregators can't deliver what they promised by imposing the P90 level, so it's some, some epsilon, and also imposing, imposing distributional robustness upon the aggregators. Then we can solve this problem. It's a bi-level uh, bi optimization problem, and we can solve it using a heuristic uh, grid search on uh, epsilon and theta. So epsilon is the P90 level. So P epsilon is probably a better word for it. And theta is the conservativeness in the distributionally robust version of the optimization problem. Today, we are here. We have no distribution robustness, at least in the requirements, and we have the 90%. 
So um, what is interesting is that in this uh, simulated case study, that's not optimal. There's, there's, oh, there are other uh, combinations of, of epsilon and theta that are more optimal. And that's really interesting because that, that maybe alludes to the fact that the, the TSO can, can alter a little bit it, its requirements to, to get more flexibility from, from uh, demand side aggregators. But it's a compromise, uh, of course. Uh, if, if we set epsilon too high, then we allow maybe too much uh, flexibility from demand side aggregators that cannot be realized in, in reality. And also if uh, theta is, is, is too high, we, it's perhaps too restri restrictive as well. So we need to have a proper combination of those two. So that concludes uh, research question number three. So what we showed is that there's a significant synergy effect of aggregating demand side assets. And it's 1.9 when bidding into MFR, but as soon as we introduce rebound, it's only 1.2. So rebound is, takes away some of the profits. And EV participating in FCRD within a grant portfolio can earn as much as 850 kroners per year per EV. That corresponds to reducing uh, its annual cost by almost 10%. We showed how, from an aggregator perspective, we can allocate payments to our flexible demands using Shapley values. Um, and we also then finally showed how we can model this P90 requirement of Energinet using joint chance constraints, both in a, uh, um, in a distributionally robust version and in, in a regular version. We show how aggregators can exploit it, exploit this requirement to maximize their profit. And we can also show how the TSO can in turn knowing well that aggregators will do that, perhaps set better levels. So finally, I'll talk about the conclusions of my thesis and a little bit about future work as well. So with research question number one, we looked at the ecosystem of bringing demand side flexibility to ancillary service markets in Denmark. There's quite a high barrier to entry for, for outside aggregators coming in and wanting to form a business relationship with flexible demands, but also BRPs and so on. I will say there's also an alternative, that is that aggregators can become a BRP by themselves, but that's still a little bit of a hassle. And what we show is that the independent aggregator can just get started with this as well. And again, this is for energy intensive uh, ancillary services for, for, for FCR and FCRD and so on. There's not uh, this is not a big problem. But in the new market model, there's a need for, for some kind of settlement scheme from a system perspective to figure out the imbalances aggregators will impose on, on, on other BRPs. In research question number two, we developed a two-stage uh, stochastic mixed integer linear program for bidding into the MFR market in Denmark. We showed how we can do that by using McCormick relaxation to model the bidding logic. And then we showed how TCLs can profit from participating in FCR and MFR or by doing load shifting. Load shifting is sometimes more profitable than, than, than MFR, which can pose a problem to the TSO. And FCR doesn't have, FCR is very attractive. It doesn't have an impact on the uh, temperature as much as uh, MFR has or, or, or as much as load shifting has. And then for the last research question, I'll just briefly go through it. Uh, again, we showed there's a significant synergy effect of aggregating assets. We use Shapley values to allocate payments within the aggregator portfolio. We modeled the P90 requirement using joint change constraints. We gave tractable formulations for the regular joint change constraint, but also for the distributionally robust version of it, and they can be easily solved. And then we post, uh, so basically those, those models were profit maximization problems from an aggregator's perspective. And then finally, we showed how the TSO can use that to set the proper level uh, of, uh, of the P90 requirement and the dis distributionally ro uh, robustness level to maximize its actual re uh, realized uh, uh, flexibility procurement. Lastly, uh, some future research directions. Again, the settlement scheme I just talked about could be interesting to, to look at. We only consider the subset of revenue streams. There are many other revenue streams that, that we haven't talked about. This revenue sharing model between the aggregator, the, uh, the flexible demand, perhaps also a BRP, perhaps also a service provider or something. How, how do we make that? We, we didn't really consider that. The temperature model of the assets we used was a gray box model or a state-based model. And we could use perhaps physics-informed neural networks when we have thousands and thousands of assets that perhaps scale better. And then on the control part, 
we only assumed uh, we just assumed that it's we are able to 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 uh, to get the correct response when delivering a given ancillary services. We, we, we didn't really consider that in this uh, thesis. Perhaps there's also a synergy effect when aggregating assets when delivering that response. Perhaps we can use something like data-driven model predictive control to that to do that. Again, and, and we, we did not consider any forecasting in this uh, thesis either. We, uh, we, we could easily increase profits, uh, especially in the case of the uh, EV spitting into FCRD by having a better forecast of the available flexibility. Again, I want to emphasize that the best decisions we take upon that forecast, we can still use our joint change constraint model uh, to do that. Lastly, in the TSO procurement problem, we did not consider the cost of procurement. That's, of course, quite natural to do and very relevant for, 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 for them to, to have that component in the bilateral optimization problem. So, so that, that should be included. Um, and uh, also, perhaps a constraint on the amount of flexibility they have to, to procure from, let's say, a, a, a regulation perspective. So that concludes also the future research directions of, uh, of, uh, of my PhD thesis and also concludes this presentation. Thank you so much for listening in.